Welcome to Module 4, the last module in our course. In this first lecture, I'm going to introduce you to open educational resources. In this lecture, we'll talk about uh, resources, sites, and organizations that you can tap into to get materials, learning objects, even full courses for your use. After you listen to this lecture, I encourage you to then look at the series of lectures that follow and watch those that have resources of interest to you because you may teach in that particular discipline. Now, the discipline-specific lectures, in fact, there are seven of them, those you do not need to worry about for the exam, so if you're not interested in math or in science, you don't need to watch them. However, if you are, I encourage you to take a look at those disciplines that will be appropriate to what you teach because there's some really great resources from some guest speakers in those lessons. But let's jump into this introduction into open educational resources. So what are open educational resources, or commonly called OERs in the educational technology field. These resources are materials that are generally created by higher education institutions or the faculty therein from around the world, and they're now openly and freely accessible to teachers to use and often repurpose or even modify in whatever way they see fit to incorporate in their lessons. And there's a vast amount of open educational resources out there for you to utilize. Now, the majority of these OERs are focused on older students, about grade seven or eight through high school. Lots of these are great for all of my um, participants in this course that are working with higher education or adult learners. Now, one, I will mention one of the sites also has some resources for younger ages, but like I said, these tend to be built by higher education institutions, so the content is a little more advanced. The nice thing about that is for many of you, may, you may be working with virtual students that are, are working at their own pace or are doing independent learning activities, and many of them may be more advanced than your curriculum offers. So you can actually use these resources to help provide more advanced instruction uh, that you may not actually have at, at, in your access at your institution or school or district. I wanted to share just a little brief history of open educational resources because I think this will help give you some context for why they exist and how you may want to use them. In 1994, Wayne Hodgins termed the, the, the phrase learning object as a standalone learning activity or material that could then be used in a variety of different educational settings. Rather than being like a single document or a single PowerPoint, although a learning object could be, what a learning object really is is a self-contained unit that could then be moved around and you could piece together learning objects from all sorts of resources to create a lesson or a learning experience. Well, that then evolved into open content. So if we now have learning objects, theoretically, and there's actually technical formats for those learning objects and different ways that those can be e easily shared, things like SCORM and other um, uh, ways to identify a learning object that can then be reused in a variety of settings and in a variety of technologies. Well, like I said, this transitioned then in 1998 to open content. And David Wiley termed this this phrase open content to reference these open materials and learning objects that are now available to, to educators via the internet to be able to reuse and repurpose in their classes. This then led to an MIT initiative that became famous worldwide. In 2001, um, MIT announced OpenCourseWare, in fact, the OpenCourseWare initiative. And their idea was they were going to put all of these great materials and resources free from what the courses they offer at MIT so that anybody could access these resources around the world. It was a commitment to being able to bring education to perhaps those that don't have access to them. Well, this started a bit of a, a revolution, and more and more sites emerged that wanted to support this open courseware initiative. At the same time, Creative Commons was founded, and Creative Commons focuses on the licensing of these open materials and basically makes them available once again to you as educators to reuse, repurpose, and in many times, in many cases, modify for your own educational use. 
Now, Creative Commons goes beyond education. It also helps license materials that even commercial providers um, may want to share. So it's more than just education, but it's used very heavily in this open courseware movement uh, within education. In 2002, UNESCO coined the phrase open educational resources. So we've progressed from a learning objects to open content to this open course for initiative. And now the collective of these resources are open educational resources. Once again, geared towards educating or providing educational opportunities to everyone around the world. And then finally, in 2008, the consortium focused on OpenCourseWare, it's called OCWC, or the OpenCourseWare Consortium, was became an independent nonprofit organization. It had formed before that, but evolved into this nonprofit organization and a central site for where you can actually get resources and courses and materials from these institutions that are contributing to the OpenCourseWare initiative. So speaking of sites, where can you actually go get open educational resources to utilize in your courses? One of the first sites, and obviously one of the founders of this, of this initiative, is the MIT OpenCourseWare site. You can see here they have a great site where you can search for particular courses or disciplines and go grab materials, videos, courses, lessons, assessments, and all sorts of other resources that you may want to utilize in your courses. I will comment that some of these materials as well have moved to iTunes U. So if you haven't ever checked out iTunes U, there's some, this is another great place to get these resources, particularly some of the audio and video resources. I had mentioned before the OpenCourseWare Consortium. The consortium has its own site as well that basically does a search of all of the independent university and college sites out there around the world that have contributed to the OpenCourseWare Consortium. And there's hundreds of thousands of learning objects embedded in the OpenCourseWare Consortium materials. And hundreds and hundreds of courses, over 150 institutions participate in the OpenCourseWare um, Consortium. And you can see here, they're currently tracking 35,000 courses. This is a great site, once again, for you to go search for materials. And for those of you outside of the US, you can actually search materials by language. And there's quite a few um, providers of resources to the OpenCourseWare Consortium from countries outside of the US. You also have access to Merlot. And Merlot was born out of the California State University system. It is a consortium and also a collection of open educational resources. This is the site that has some resources that could be used with younger children. Um, and in fact, this probably of all the sites has maybe the most K-12 specific resources available. Although once again, remember that those other um, open courseware initiatives and sites have materials that would be great for students that need to move beyond your curriculum or are interested in subjects outside of those that you can offer in a virtual way. So back to Merlot. This is a great site to search for and even contribute to resources and simulations and learning objects. There'll be lesson plans and methods of assessment embedded in how you may want to use these virtual learning um, uh, objects for you in your classes. And then finally, we have Connections. Connections is another site. It's actually heavily um, supported by institutions outside of the US. And Connections also provides great resources for um, provided by universities predominantly, but for students to utilize of, of a variety of ages. I encourage you to check out these four sites and look for materials specific to your lessons and see how you may want to use them. Now, I mentioned before in our history of open educational resources that the Creative Commons initiative formed in order to be able to adequately license or protect the providers of these resources and then also to protect the users of these resources or to be very clear with how they can use these resources. So Creative Commons was born and it really is just a standardized method to manage copyright. There are six different types of Creative Commons licenses. If you want to dig into what all of these types are, one of the resources on this week's resource list links you to the Creative Commons site. 
But basically, they tell you everything from you have an open license to use this in any which way you fit, feel fit. You can um, actually edit or manipulate the content. You don't have to leave it in its natural state. And you could even use it for commercial purposes. That's the broadest license, down to very specific licenses that say you can only use it in the form that it's been provided, you can only use it in non-commercial settings, and you can only um, uh, use it if you actually attribute who provided that resource. So the Creative Commons licensing gives you a lot of, of understanding about how you can use those resources that you may want to use. Now the great thing about Creative Commons licensing is it's built into those sites that we talked about. And in fact, because you may be using one of those sites, those open educational resource sites, you actually do not have to ask permission from the author to use their resources because the licensing is already built in. The other great thing is a lot of our very most popular search engines or resource repositories like Google, Flickr, Wikimedia Commons, Wikipedia, all also use Creative Commons licensing. And in fact, one of my favorite things to do is when I'm using images in my courses, I will use Google Advanced Search and go pick the type of license I want. Do I want to be able to modify something or not? Is it for a commercial setting or not? And I can do that and modify my search so that I know I'm using images or resources that are specific to the kinds of licenses I want. Now, I also encourage you to contribute to the open educational resource movement and then be very thoughtful about what kinds of licenses do you want to provide for your resources. Once again, that Creative Commons website will help you be able to find the best ways to make sure that those licenses are designated on your materials, depending on where you're contributing them to. So now that we've thought a little bit about some sites for open educational resources, as well as how to manage those open educational resources, I encourage you to think about how you may want to use them. Here's a setting you might want to think about. I'm working with two virtual students that need more advanced materials than my normal curriculum offers. They're off doing some independent learning, they're interested in some subjects that, that um, aren't specific to my curriculum, and they need some advanced work. I want to keep them motivated. I want to prepare them for college level work. So what types of resources might I actually consider using with those students? And what are some considerations about how I use these resources that I need to be aware of? While you think about that question, once again, I encourage you to go into the individual lectures that are discipline specific and see some of the great open resources provided there. Now, they didn't do searches based on these four sites I showed you here, but they're actually providing you discipline specific resources in addition to these open educational resources that you find here. They've also incorporated some games from last week um, and some perhaps social technologies from the week before. Once you've watched those, you can then progress to the MOOC lecture where we're going to be talking about how MOOCs may be appropriate to be for use in K-12 education.